The next two sessions, it's getting wise to thought battles, part one and part two. Learning to discern what's happening in your head. We know 2 Corinthians 10.5, I, I prefer the New American Standard for its more vigorous language, casting down imaginations, speculations, imaginations and speculations and every lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's such vigorous language. That's vigorous new creation. What I have is worth protecting language. The price that was paid to give me what I have, I, I don't want to be casual about that. Grace empowers me to stay in a relational mindset, not a legal framework with God, but it also empowers me to really value the gift. It empowers me to prize above all the privilege of walking in communion with God, of thinking His thoughts, of being a vessel of His love and power. And so... I have to understand and realize that I live in a jacked up world. The world is in the process of being restored and redeemed through the believers who are sowed like leaven in the lump of dough, who are called to be salt and light. And we're meant to be part of the active reformation of the world. But that day of wrath is real when Jesus returns and purges the earth of the systemic evil that exists. We get to be agents of that change. But the very fact that the world needs changing is proof that the world isn't there yet. And so whether it is Hollywood or Wall Street or <coughs> such terrible wickedness as wickedness I, what, what's the plural of wickedness? <laughs> Whatever it is, it's no joking matter. The abortion industry, the sex trafficking industry, systemic racism, uh, uh, political agendas, totalitarianism on the rise. Communism is a despicable evil. And there are so many things. Our school boards, the indoctrination of young people into the poisons of the age. We see the thought battle playing out in our youth like never before, but the thought battle is just as real for you as a new creation. It just means you're equipped from the inside out to deal with it. But deal with it you must. And there are so many imaginations, speculations, anything that raises itself against the knowledge of God is a thought to be taken captive including bad teaching about how God wants to relate to you or how you are supposed to relate to him. If it's not according to the word, but according to the traditions of men, it's a lofty speculation raised up against the knowledge of God, and he wants to deliver you from that. He wants to deliver you from evil thoughts and erroneously well-intended, good, but wrong thoughts. Everything. Everything is a thought potentially to be taken captive. Actually, I should remove the word potentially. Paul said, bring every thought into captivity. That means you should have a pretty strong filter, a, fil a truth filter, where everything that comes into your brain should go, and it forks. True? Not true. Not true? Discard it. Doesn't matter how emotionally resonant it is, how much you identify with it, how much it fits your previous experience. It filters through the word of God. It's taken captive. I reject it. Amen. Or it's true. It bears witness. It's in the word and the Holy Spirit is empowering me to lay hold of it by faith. I accept it. Paul is relentlessly clear, never more than in this verse, that our primary battle is with our own thoughts and that means thought systems. And I talked about mindsets. The mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. So our mindsets, the thought systems, the ideologies of this age, why is human trafficking wrong? Do you know? Well, that one's obvious. 
And you could probably give five reasons and there's probably five more that you need to learn to really be grounded in truth. But a lot of them are far more subtle. A lot of them are far more insidious. A lot of them are far more noble in appearance. Critical race theory has captivated the conversation of this generation. Do you know if it's right or wrong? Do you know why it's right or wrong? Paul says, capture your thoughts, your mindsets. He says, take every thought captive. It's more than the explicit moral failures we call sin. To make matters worse, because all secret thoughts enter, uh, all secret inner thoughts occur inside our mind, we assume all thoughts are ours. Right? This is part of the battle. All that stuff that's happening in here, because it's located in here, you think it is in here. That's part of the illusion until you really understand how you're constructed, how you're designed as a dimensional portal that is body, soul, spirit in the original design was meant to fellowship with the spirit without interference. So now part of taking every thought captive is getting the right framework to understand how you function, whether you know it or not. Let me give a simple framework. Some questions that will help illustrate the premise in this session and the next session. What are the physics of the spirit realm? You don't have to answer these. I just want to get your brain greased up. What are the physics of the spirit realm? How does it operate? Consider for a moment the vacuum of space permits no sound. But even that is simply the the material construct that we call space and time, which is our universe. So when I talk about the vacuum of space and you picture the total emptiness, you picture that total emptiness within the present construct. Now I'm going to get kind of wonky here for a minute, but work with me. Before God said, let there be, what was there? See, if I talk about the emptiness of space, we assume that that is like what was there before God said, let there be, because we don't know how to imagine something more empty than empty. You pick a spot with no stars or the gap between stars, and we call that the emptiness of space. There's no air, there's no oxygen, there's no mass, there's no matter. They're starting to find quantum this and dark matter and, you know, all kinds of fancy names. But to the human experience, that emptiness is what we imagine existed when God finally said, basically, let there be planets. And so space was there, and God spoke and filled it with mass. But that's not accurate. Time and space are part of what the creative process required for mass, four planets, four galaxies. God said, let there be, and there was something that existed where only God was and nothing else, not even the emptiness of space. Picture the emptiness of space, now take that away. The brain short circuits. So how did angels talk to one another there? The reason you can hear me talk is because even though the air looks empty, we have something called air. There's a mix of oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen and other gases in the room, and it's pressurized under a certain uh, uh, environmental weight, the gravity of the earth, the pressure of our, uh, uh, I don't even remember, the pounds per square inch of our breathable air that's a mix of gases. And as I'm talking, the muscles in my throat are modulating and vibrating and my mouth is forming words out of my physical substrate that your physical substrate has ears with an eardrum and the different pieces. And my 
voice is rippling over the medium of the air, if we were in outer space and somehow could breathe without air and I talked to you, you would just see my mouth moving like this because there's nothing coming out. Because there is no medium by which my voice can be transmitted, the sound waves of my voice can be transmitted from my mouth to your ear. So my physical reality intersects with your physical reality by virtue of the invisible space between us actually having stuff in it that transmits the sound wave to you. That's our physics. What are the physics of the spirit realm? In that dimension that's beyond this dimension, how do angels talk to one another when there is no oxygen? What do angels breathe? The noises they make, the worship they give, when they cry out, holy, 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 how is that sound understood and interpreted? Well, in that dimension, according to the physics of it, it's very plain. And so the prophets who saw into it were allowed to understand what was happening. But how does that non-material construct translate into our material reality? The answer is the amazing faculties of the human soul. For us, more than merely gray matter... There's something fundamentally spiritual within us housed in a material construct. Your spinal cortex, your prefrontal lobe, the electrical currents traveling among billions of synapses, extending the frequency range of those material qualities into immaterial terms. We know that there are sound waves that we can hear. They're perceivable human sound waves but those sound waves actually extend in both directions beyond what we can perceive. The frequency of sound has a limited bandwidth that you can hear, but there is a bandwidth that goes beyond it in either direction that you can't. There's light waves. There's colors. What if I told you, think of a new color? All you're going to do is think of some other combination of colors that's within your reference point. You can't think of other colors because your eye is tuned to the frequency of light that bounces off the different objects that reflects in such a way that your brain interprets as blue or green or pink. And if I say think of another color, well, it's like, well, there's this sparkling gold iridescent rainbow-like thing, and I just defined all the colors I already know. But the light spectrum also has things beyond it in either direction. We see in the visible spectrum of light, but there are invisible spectrums. Gamma and beta and I don't, I don't even remember them all. X-ray and this, that, and the other. Ultraviolet. Whatever he said. <laughs> These are things that go beyond our human experience, but they are part of reality. So what we call our mind, will, and emotions, the soul, all of this together reveals that when you get an impression from God, of course we know His Spirit is living inside of us, but that's actually playing itself out. Have you ever been in ministry and you just felt overwhelmed with compassion? You started to cry or, or, or feel joy, or whatever, the spirit inside you is translating his feelings for that person into your emotions so that you know how to minister to them. You get an impression and you see something in the spirit. What does that even mean? But you see something in the spirit and your physical framework interprets the data because you aren't just a physical framework. Your soul was designed to be a portal. Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. The gifts of the Spirit are operating in and through us, interfacing one dimension to the next because you're a portal. You aren't just a body. You aren't just a person. You are a living spirit wrapped in an earth suit. 
And so your faculties are actually highly sensitive to both dimensions. Part of the problem is that while we are a hybrid of natural and supernatural qualities, we were once whole. We were once fully activated. We were once complete. The harmony and synergy between body, soul, and spirit was not fractured. There weren't parts of us that were shattered that now have to be re-evangelized into belief. The knowledge of God was natural. Confidence in God was natural. We didn't see through filters. We didn't have the bad Polaroids. We didn't have the infection of lies and the poison of those things. And when Adam fell, he fell so completely that every part of him fell. And redemption is the glory of God redeeming every part. It starts with the new creation reconnecting you spirit to spirit so that you are alive on the inside, not dead. But there's still the process of reintegration of all of the parts of us that is this life we call the sanctified life. The intertwined nature of our previous union became this new vastly complicated reality where we are motivated by things we don't even know we're motivated by, why we're motivated by, but we are motivated by them nonetheless. It's like a bad zombie movie. We're the living dead. And in a zombie movie, they're animated. They appear to be alive, but they have this strange desire to feast on human brains. I'm sorry, it's kind of gross. That's the zombie culture, right? But we don't realize how much of our own motivations are just as absurd, just as grotesque, just as broken and defiled The adult man that has this sick craving for a little girl. The gender confusion that creeps in and now becomes normal. The new thing is called transhumanism where people don't feel comfortable as humans. They want to be a dolphin. Or there's a new thing coming out where people are feeling this uh, body dysmorphia, not just in their gender identity, but in the essence of their humanity. It's like my arms make me feel weird, and I want to have them amputated. I want robot arms, and I want insurance to pay for it. Well, something is really broken there that wasn't in the original design at all. We know that, but our body and, and, and our, our, our soul and our spirit we're in total separation from God before Christ. We're dying in body subject to all manner of diseases and infirmities. Cursed in our soul with varied inclinations to a wide spectrum of psychosis, phobias, and toxic emotions. And that seamless integration between those three is now segregated one from the other, causing us to doubt ourselves. Self-doubt, suspicion, gullibility, dullness, and all the ways these parts talk to each other. I talked about how this is a picture of a picture that God was given. I mean, God gave Moses. He said, build it according to the pattern. And this is a picture of how God is restoring and redeeming by putting his spirit inside of us, wrapped the whole thing in skin so that this could be a picture of humanity. And so that thing, just imagine you, the outer court, that yellow line is, is your skin, it's your body. Your soul, those faculties that you have for interacting with one another and translating supernatural data into a natural construct. And your spirit as the Holy of Holies where Christ dwells that has a direct line in fellowship and friendship and prayer and worship to the Lord. But your hand, your DNA, your eye, your ear, your brain, all of these are sending out the light you receive, this is why we have to be enlightened. If your eye is single, your whole body is filled with light. It's actually a picture of your entire being re being remade into the new creation reality you are meant to live in. But if your eye is 
contaminated, that process happens in reverse. You're taking in all kinds of negative data and you might assume it's you talking. You might assume it's you thinking and you don't realize you're in a war and you're set up to be a portal and you can't stop being a portal without shutting down God in the process also. I don't wanna shut down God, which means I have to learn to take every thought captive and discern what is of the Holy Spirit, what is of an evil spirit, and what is of myself. And if I do that rightly, I can actually flood my entire being with the light and revelation of God in Christ. If I do it wrongly, I recaptivate my entire being to things that are less than I am meant to live in. 